this uh, Ben Vonderheide? Yes, Ben Vonderheide, that's correct. Vonderheide, great, great, yeah. For a moment, I was a little concerned that maybe you had decided not to uh, do the show because I was a little concerned that maybe I uh, burst your bubble when I made it clear yesterday that the show was going to be audio only, and I never told you that, so if I had led you to uh, believe that you were going to be able to show pictures of the the ancient alien artifacts on this show, well, that's not going to be possible. I've never used a webcam. In fact, I prefer to keep the show audio only because it kind of keeps the integrity of my radio voice, which everybody, thousands of people say I have, although it's what I okay. say with this voice. Rather well, than... You know, my job is uh, at this point in time, of course, I'm representing the family collection, but I also more so I'm in the process of education, of uh, exposure and awareness about the stones, so your format is uh, is a great way to do that, and obviously you know how to do that best, and if it's radio, then that's what it is. I have a face for radio, so that works out, as they say, right? Right, right. Okay, so uh, I guess um, I might as well include this little uh, chat that we just had when I upload this to YouTube. Uh, usually I do a countdown to start the show, but that won't be necessary now. Let's just start this off now, and... Uh, well, I met you, I believe it was at the um, Langhorn uh, Sheraton uh, for the um, Pennsylvania MUFON chapter conference that goes on there every October, although now it's going to go start com coming on in May, John Ventry said, because of uh, conflicts with Alien Con and whatnot, which, by the way, I was at uh, in Baltimore uh, this past weekend, and I got a few things about that conference that I might as well uh, point out uh, in this interview with you um, to get your take, but before I get into what I experienced at Alien Con, I think uh, this is about you and what you have seen in life that causes you to do uh, the stuff that you do pertaining to Ancient Alien Stones, your website, ancientalienstones.com. Um, well, first of all, what is Namoli? Um, that's, that appears, um, seems like everywhere you, uh, you, on your card and also in the email, also on the card it says museum exhibited artifacts, mysterious and mystical healing power. The word, word healing power is in yellow letters in contrast to the other things as is Namoli. Everything else is red letters, but Namoli and healing power are in red letters. And then it has your, uh, has your name, um, and some stones on the back of the card that I got here from you. But, uh. What uh, did what did you see in your life that caused you to get into the whole ancient alien stones hobby? Um, when it comes to ancient aliens, the um, nine, uh, 2009 uh, Chariots of the Gods uh, de facto um, pilot episode, two hours on the History Channel, was what got me really into it. But I've been fascinated with UFOs even since I was a kid. But anyhow, like I said, this is about you. What did you experience that got you into the whole alien, ancient alien, and uh, artifacts phenomenon? Well, I don't want to, to derail your entire uh, question, but I almost have to. It's really... It's all right. I don't think it's Doesn't much about me. me. Yeah, it's not really about me. And particularly in that, there wasn't any... When I began to collect No Moli stones, it was not related to ancient alien, uh, the ancient alien perspective or the ancient alien theories. I was only aware of those uh, over the past couple of years. So I can't claim that I was uh, somehow enlightened beyond the average person and, and went looking for these things. It's more the other way around that they found me. Uh, I have always been interested in spiritual and um, things of higher realm, and so that would be perhaps the only thing that would correlate this to me. I'm, I'm just a uh, American businessman and and uh, myself and my family collected these stones. We had a very uh, unusual and unique opportunity through a connection that most people would, very few people would ever have. And uh, quite frankly, collected them without knowing what they were. But I felt that they did have, uh, they just always felt very interesting, uh, enigmatic, and um, powerful. Um, so over the years, we gathered a collection, and um, uh, then inevitably when it became time, we decided to share the collection and sell some of the pieces is when we started to do the, the further investigation of what they were. And, um, and, f and that's where I found, I tracked down and found Professor Kwakua Forianza, who would be a world 
where most experts. So I guess I should back up then and say what Nomali are, since we've decided, since I, like I said, it's not really about me, it's about Nomali, which the interesting thing about Nomali, Andrew, and I appreciate you inviting me on your show, Nature of Reality, it's awesome to get this opportunity. What I found that was most surprising to me was how scarce information was on them and how few people knew of or or were even aware of them, particularly with the aficionados in the ancient alien uh, scenario and in relation to TV shows and programs that you would see. I've just never seen them, never seen them. In fact, I've been in touch with ancient aliens, television, uh, Prometheus Productions the last couple of years to include them in an episode. They have uh, thus far not been able to get that into a, an episode and fit it in. I, I don't know exactly where I could discuss why I think that that's regardless. The point is this. Um, it, it's kind of a double-edged uh, sword where when you find something that no one else has and you you, you just feel really blessed and amazed that something like this could be so unknown in a world where everything is known and a particular ancient or uh, particularly carved artifacts made of stone in some instances which have elongated heads etc are very well publicized uh, in fact you'll see the sa- what ones are known from central america south america egypt you'll see them uh, repeatedly on television shows but you will not see normally so what are normally Well, I will say this. At that show you're talking about, it was interesting. The only person who had ever even heard of Nomoli was Bill Burgess when he came to the booth. Of course, you know Bill Burgess from uh, UFO Hunters, the producer of that show. Don't you mean You mean Burns. It's not Burgess. Oh, Bill Burns. Burns. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Burns. Thank you. I was talking to somebody else for a second. I got sidetracked. Yeah, Bill Burns. Forgive me, Bill Burns. A great guy and a pioneer. And a foremost uh, expert in the world of, in this realm, and he had heard of Nomoli and were aware that they were a deity in Africa, but was unaware and had never seen the Nomoli stones. So, what are Nomoli? Nomoli are, um, they were, the, the natives would say they were gods who lived in the heaven. Well, let me do this. I like to. A lot of times, uh, put let other people say things that they might be better equipped to say. So, back there was one show I think back in the 1990s, Unsolved Mysteries. You remember that show? Yes, I do remember that uh, that show. Yeah. So they would. So here's what their quote was: Myth and legend of Western Africa says that in ancient times, a people of angels lived in heaven. As a cause of bad behavior, God banned them from the divine empire. To punish the angels, he transformed them into men and sends them to earth. The Nomali statues are said to be reminders of those once divine creatures. The natives often called the figures men in stone, but some see them as guardian gods who bring luck. There's another one up here. There's a uh, website called MessageToEagle.com. Are, are you familiar with them by chance? Uh, MessageToEagle.com? Uh, is yeah. that a – I don't think I've ever heard of that. What's that? Well, they, in August 2014, they're, they're, they focus on the uh, ancient alien theories, I believe, for the most part. So they put down amongst many ancient relics that definitely threaten our traditional school of thought are the so-called – Nomali figures found in Sierra Leone, West Africa. The Nomali are controversial stone figures dated from 2,500 years ago to approximately 15,000 B.C. And I'll tell you some others on that uh, as far as this quote. They seem to prove the existence of an ancient civilization much more advanced than it should be. All the indications that are about 17,000 years ago, a highly sophisticated civilization existed in the current West Africa. So there is a theory, and, and I've talked to professors and others who, who um, consider this a, a valid potential theory, that before there was Egypt as a central uh, where they built pyramids, etc., as one professor said, they didn't just build pyramids all of a sudden. 
he said they had been doing these things for hundreds of years, and there is a belief that in West Africa, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years ago existed a civilization whereupon they actually eventually uh, staked out Egypt and transferred their knowledge and higher uh, higher achievements to Egypt. And then that kingdom was sunk into the into the jungle at some point. So with these thoughts in mind, what are Nomali stones? Well, again, the natives say that the gods came down and they were men in stone or gods of stone, and they gave these stones to humans. These were not carved by humans, the original Nomali stones. And they represent what the Nomali gods looked like. Some of them look like the gods themselves. Some look like a combination of the god and a human. Some will have reptiles, usually a crocodile, um, infused into the human, which indicate the powers of Nomali gods. So in other words, the Nomali gods live with the humans and tr try to infuse in within them the, the values and the things that they could do to help them out and move them forward as, as a race, as a society. So the stones themselves, um, Nomali stones, the first they became known to the outside world was in the 1600s when Portuguese sailors landed in West Africa. They are found in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, West Africa. In the bush, they are carved, most of them out of soapstone, some out of granite, some out of ironstone, some out of stones which I haven't defined yet. And um, they were dug up. So before there was no outside knowledge of them, and even at that point in time, the only knowledge that they had was they were found. Now, unlike Andrew, most relics and artifacts that you will find will be at grave sites or at temples. These are randomly buried in the jungle. Quite often, only one of them. In, case, in most cases, in the ones I've come across, only one of them at a time is found. They're uncovered in diamond mining, which is where the uh, source that we had was in the diamond business. And uh, they're uncovered by farmers and others who, for whatever reason, would turn the soil. They ha are then repurposed over the years, and, um, and some by individuals, some by families, some by the entire tribe would be used in, in rituals. So there's, I guess, the first basis of Nomali. Uh, what are they? They're stones. They look similar to some of them. There are different designs. Some look similar to the stones that you'll find in other parts of the world with the elongated heads. And um, um, there are those who believe that they contain power. In fact, I can give you some examples of, of other individuals who have used the, some of the stones from our set, from our collection. Yeah, by all so, means, uh, do that. Um, I got some questions for you and all, but I'll wait until you uh, finish there with the uh, with that with that thing you just said about the other people that you know of that have. Uh, have no, done. go ahead if you have any questions of uh, anything so far. All right. Um, well, for one, uh, the stone figures um, dated as far back as fifteen thousand BC and seventeen thousand BC. That's not to. Um, not not too far away from the uh, so-called fall of Atlantis, which was said to happen about 13,000 years ago. So that begs the question, if these stones are, are from that long, one would have to think they got some connection to that lost civilization. So, um, well, if Atlantis is not something you research at all, then, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't be asking this, but if you can comment oh, well, in any way. Oh, I, well, I will say this. I'm 59 years old, and... Since the 1970s, I've been very open-minded. Uh, you know, my mother was into, and I've read the Edgar Casey and and studied Atlantis and and Lemuria, and uh, and always been interested in all the the potential that uh, that God has put on in the universe, whatever way He wants it to be. I'm pretty open-minded. <laughs> so yes, as far and there have been one of the things that we have done. It's, it's adventurous. You know, we take this. We took the stones. And um, 
we found the professor, who Professor of Kwaku of Foyanza. He's uh, in his 80s, a very good man, genius. Was born in Ghana, West Africa, and for the 37 years I believe, or around there, he was the professor of African art at Howard University in Washington D.C., a very renowned and prestigious university. Um, so we we hooked up with. Professor uh, Foyanza, he was excited to find that there was such a collection. He authenticated the collection. We then decided before that we before we would break them up, since it was so unique, even more much more unique than we realized over the years we had them, that we should exhibit them once for the public. And so we exhibited them at the African Art Museum of Maryland, a wonderful little museum in. Uh, Baltimore area, and we exhibited them there for a year and a half or two years, and um, and yes, then we have them out, and we've gone to a couple of shows, of uh, MUFON shows over the over the summer, and and uh, that's where I ran into you. So we're really just getting the word out now. Professor Foyanza, this is an interesting thing, would has decided he's writing a book. We're writing a book now on the Nomali, as he would say. There's such a scarcity of information; it begs to be written. The it's interesting why they were suppressed. If I could take a minute just on that, would that be all right? So yeah, sorry, I was on mute. So uh, yes, you you can go into that. Yeah. So the reason why it's interesting, if you were to compare the exact opposite, polar opposite would be Native American power stones. There is a, certainly an interest in them. The value is amazingly has risen amazingly exponentially, rather, and and they are they there is a, a recognition and appreciation and honor and respect for the power which are in ancient um, Native American sculptures. It's the same with some of the South American and Egyptian. There are those who venerate these uh, these stones and 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 are trying to reinvigorate the power of the native uh, contact they had, whether it was with aliens or whatever form it was. In West Africa, the stones were buried, for one thing, under the ground. That's one reason they were suppressed, just physically. Secondly, when they've been dug up, there are political, religious, social, even medical reasons why, scientific reasons. The most significant is that it's a very heavy Muslimization uh, some would say more radical Muslimization is taken hold over there, and ultimately there is also some radical Christianity that would be in the bush fighting to um, place their values upon the natives. Those individuals would very much consider anything of this manner to be evil, straight up, and they would destroy it and they would suppress it. So religiously, religious-wise, Socially, a very big, big factor. In Africa and in West Africa, there is a great desire to be seen as modern and as cultured, even amongst the African professors I've spoken with at universities. They distance themselves completely from what, any, what they would consider primitive or the, the ancient uh, practices of the tribal natives. They would absolutely not have interest in promoting those. They ignore them, even though they'll wear the colors and they'll play the music when it comes right down to it. They do not want to be associated with that. For medical reasons, of course, the natives would have believed these things had power and would have used them for their purposes and and the science and, and medical culture would have purposely tried to suppress that also. So overall, uh, with that, you end up with a an artifact that is relatively, uh, com- well, completely unknown. And again, at a conference with where we were at, Andrew, and I, I would anticipate, that I think I asked you at the conference, I believe you've, you've never seen them, at a conference which was filled with a couple hundred of the most uh, knowledgeable people in the ancient alien spectrum. Only one person, Bill, had ever heard of them, and no one had ever seen the stones. So that's an 
very interesting to me. But uh, uh, go ahead. I know you had another question, I believe. Well, another. Um... I talk about Atlantis too. Oh yeah, some the of the, Some of the uh, stone whisperers we've shown them to, but but we can get back to that if you have another question. Well, I wanted to also ask about, geographically speaking, uh, where these uh, stones were found, Sierra Leone region and around that. That's not too far from uh, from the Dogon tribe of Mali, and everybody knows the Dogon tribe as being the uh, probably most well-known for the whole serious star system thing and the fact that they knew that it was a star system with more than one star. Uh, before mainstream science knew about it, and uh, everybody seems to interpret that as meaning that they had contact with uh, some sort of extraterrestrial life form. So uh, it's not too far away from uh, from that area of Africa, but is this just uh, could there possibly be a connection, or would you say no, no? There's really no no connection there. It's just that um, it's just geographically speaking, it seems like there is, but there isn't. Well, again, I would ref I would um, uh, point to those who have better knowledge and, and those who I've asked who have better knowledge of the art and and culture w would say that it's uh, I guess as we would say here a hop, skip, and a jump, <clears throat> you know, from the Dogon. And there are some similar designs in Nomali, some Nomali compared to some Dogon. So there is. And certainly, I believe the Dogon in the series were they not reptilian based? Is that a reptilian based culture, uh, alien technology? Or I alien don't think they said anything about that. Uh, well, there's stuff I can tell you all about the different species of ETs that are said to be from Sirius, and there is one malevolent reptilian race, but uh, that's a whole new other can of worms. Um, yeah, was well, so. that the Syrian? Were they the reptilian race? Well, I don't know if there are, if the race from Sirius that the Dogon allegedly communicated with was um, the uh, malevolent reptilians from from okay. Sirius, but um, that's they're not the only race from there. There's a lot of contactees like Sheldon Nidal and such who are very uh, prominent with the Sirius system and uh, say that there's definitely other forms of life out there that could be the the ones that are in contact with the Dogon and and other tribes around the world. But yes, I would say that there is uh, you know definitely a potential for the being the connection, especially if you're looking back tens of thousands of years. I believe the one that they were talking about there was the, they found Nomali in that uh, the blue stone that comes from meteor activity, and they identified that was 15 to 17,000 years old, which was also interesting. Um, so if you go back that far, I, it's not too far-fetched to think that a culture would have reached across those areas. Okay, and uh, the myth and legend of Western Africa says, and I'm reading off your site here, in ancient times a, a people of angels lived in heaven. Well, angels, uh, what exactly are we talking about here? Because there's a whole mistranslation thing regarding um, angels and how it originally comes from a word that means messenger, but it's kind of been um, like that, that part's been ignored that an angel is supposed to have messenger um, qualities, uh, also the whole um, stereotype of angels with uh, light winged figures dressed in white with a halo around above their head. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not really what <laughs> angels look like. That's kind of been a, a, a pop culture um, stereotype. Um, so these angels that uh, the people of angels that lived in heaven um, has the myth and legend of Western Africa given a nice uh, physical, or should I say, spirit uh, physical description of something that's actually spirit spiritual of of the angels. Well, they certainly what they've said is that these particular angels misbehaved and were turned to stone and came to to the earth. And if you look at the traditional Nomali, the ones that are more configured like the gods, not combinations, they are all, always going to have a squatty legs, short legs. They're going to have larger eyes because the eyes were said to be so brilliant you couldn't look into them. They were that powerful and radiant, and that they had big, uh, they'll have big lips usually, that, and their voices were said to be so loud they could be heard in the next village. So, and they uh, infused their power into the crocodiles was uh, one of the beliefs. Well, it does point out here that the Mali stones are said to be a reminder 
of uh, those once divine creatures that were um, that were kind of misbehaved and got transformed into men by God, whoever God is. Um, well, uh, since I mentioned that, uh, this God, um, there's all the the people that say God should mean gods, uh, all the Zachariah Sitchin followers who uh, talk about the gods with a lowercase g making man in uh, their image and their likeness. Um, but you have the word God here in capital letters, implying that the uh, the people of Western Africa did um, perhaps follow a uh, religion and not so much a um, spiritual but not religious um, belief on life, because most spiritual but not religious people would say there is no God. It's because uh, we're all gods, because we're all infinite consciousness, and God is infinite consciousness and all the things that it can manifest in. Um, but this is capital G, God, implying religion. So um, what did they see their God as? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Andrew, in that, um, how do I explain this? You know, we have this vision of West Africa, from when I was young, the, the TV, the movies, uh, Tarzan was on TV. It was great. We loved it, and we loved the nature and the wildlife it showed. And, and they showed these tribes with maybe, you know, 50 or 100 people in them. Well, I'd be, you know, I was surprised myself to learn, but in West Africa and Sierra Leone, there are, you know, it depends on who you ask, because I don't know who's counting there, but a million eight hundred thousand or two million one hundred thousand people living in Sierra Leone, many of them in the jungle, in the bush, in smaller tribes, some, but other tribes are 10,000 and 5,000 people living out in the middle of the bush in their own society. And so why I point this out, there's no great communication between these villages either. There can be great differences between them. They can be diverse and perceptions of God and culture and uh, what their spirit leaders would believe in one can be very diverse from what the next one can believe. Uh, you would have a witch doctor. You would have medicine men, medicine women. And each village would have their own, and they would also be somewhat different and, and individual. So with the Nomali stones, we can have, it's an interesting, the one book that was written, that had any in them, was a few pages about the stones. It was a book on Nomali, more about the culture and, and the conquest of the area. And there was a short section on Nomali stones. And, and I can tell you that everything in that section, I think it was written some, many years ago, was completely different than what I've heard from the tribes or heard from, from the, the sources that we've got the stones from. Because that's what they believed on that island. And that's what their perception was. So this guy went there. That's the only place he was at. That's He's got uh, his version of what the Nomali were, came from them and them alone. And that was the standard. That was the only thing, although well, it wasn't well-researched, nobody looked much at it. But those, if you would look it up, that would have been what you'd have thought. But that's completely different from the middle of the bush, where that island is. They're They're absolutely different. But they all believe that they came from the gods. I don't know if they say God or gods. And again, it's interesting because even the words can be translated and spelled differently because they're coming from Africa. Africa and West Africa is an interesting place that way. They're called Nomali stones. They're called Sapi stones. They're called Pumdo stones, depending on where you're at. Um, you know you know, kind of what I'm saying? So I, I'm not trying to be uh, uh, nebulous, but I'm saying that you can't, uh, I can't certainly speak for all those tribal beliefs across all those regions, especially if it's been, uh, how would you say, diluted and diverted and cha perhaps changed over the millennium since they were dug up. Because nobody would, nobody over there would say they know who buried these. No native today would say, my great-great-grandfather buried one of these. And we dug it back up. They would say that the gods buried them. Now, some would say that their ancestors buried them, but it was so long ago that they don't have any recollection of that. The only when when the stones come from the bush, the only origin, everything that they talk about from them, is from the day they dug them up. Now, some of them 
they would say they've had through millennium. So they were dug up or found or given by the gods, God, uh, thousands or tens of thousands of years ago, they would say. Well, thank you for giving your take on that. A uh, little contradiction I'm seeing here. I mean, it says the last sentence here, but some see them, uh, the figures in the Naomi uh, stones, They, they, some see them as guardian gods who bring luck. Um, that seems kind of counterintuitive given the story here. I mean, God allegedly punished these creatures because of their bad behavior. So how can anyone see them as guardian gods who bring luck when all they did was misbehave? Things that don't mis that don't behave don't bring luck. <laughs> see where I'm there going a, with this? So yeah, there is a conflict there, uh, but clearly the the natives throughout believe that these are very powerful and that there is fortune when you find them, that they are empowered by the gods, and that while they misbehaved in heaven, um, you know, there are some who believe that they, the, when they misbehave, God believes they're misbehaving by enlightening mankind into the divine knowledge they possess. Uh, so I, I can't speak to that for sure, but yes, there is a little bit of a conflict. Now, that also comes somewhat from when that sentence I think you're reading there comes from the more uh, modern, let's say the last 300 years. What they have observed is this: when they are found by farmers or by others, they repurpose them, and they will put a shrine in the middle of their field, and put the stone on that shrine, and then expect for that shrine to and that stone to help their crops. There has also been some tribals, tribal, tribal history of some tribes where if they don't get a good tro uh, crop, they hit the stone with sticks to, you know, punish the gods. So, again, you've got all these diverse and disconnected cultures. They have some beliefs amongst them that seem to be similar, but they can be different. And then, of course, you'll have, you'll have different levels of information. Let me let me give you an example. We might get a stone, the twin stone, uh, which is the only one I've ever I've ever had access to. I've seen one other image like that, twin stone where they're both laying in similar to a sarcophagus or uh, you know like a little half of a bullet, and they're they're laying in that two Nomali gods. And when that comes out of the bush. The word that we got with that was that that was represented twins and was given to a mother to protect her and the twins at childbirth and thereafter. Now, if we take that to Professor Kwakor Frianza, he would tell us that African art-wise, culturally, when these twin images, whether it's two heads out of the torso or two faces out of the head, sometimes we have a two faces and two different faces. The left face is different than the right face. When you have a twin stone, he would say that indicates when the spiritual and the physical beings merge to become a higher self. So that would be the understanding from an African artistic perspective. But now you take this other genre that is relatively more new, and that is uh, this new theoretical uh, group, if you will, that is in believes that ancient aliens were in contact with humans, and it is possible that they rained down from the heavens and that the natives were factually say, saying what they saw and they to the images of these of what rained down from heaven from that perspective, this same stone is a two of these nomali gods in a sarcophagus. It gets rained down and flies to the earth and then opens up, and the two nomalis are in there. And this is what the artist rendered. So I guess I'm saying yes, conflict and um, uh, enigma and mystery is with the stone. So then we take them to the next level since we don't know that much. It was, like I said, it's kind of adventurous. We take them to, we get the information if some comes with them out of the bush, sometimes it doesn't. We then get an artistic perspective. Then we get take them to those who are more of the ancient alien perspective, get their input. And then we can take them to stone readers, if you will. And as a show that we were just at, where we saw you, there will be 
people who come through who I can only describe as stone whisperers, who when they hold stones, they get a message, and they can read the stones, and then they tell us things about them. When they read us, read the stones, they tell us things, which interestingly, after they tell, them, tell us about them, it's kind of obvious. That makes sense. You look at it now, you can see how that is. Um, and they will tell us how old they think they are. They'll tell us how they believe they were used and um, what the specific power is. Some believe that there are some of the stones are very much, again, very powerful and will give you energy and help to conquer weakness and uh, and break it, break in any break in the system, electromagnetic system of the body, etc. There are others that would calm. There are others that would be specifically for uh, fertility. There are others that would be specifically for females or male fertility. Um, there are some which they have uh, individuals have meditated with, and they have. Uh, great experiences, powerful, uh, life-changing experiences, I would say. Oh, I'm sure they were. Um, and uh, this uh, this um, battle of sorts that went on, I don't know if it was, it doesn't specify here if it was a battle, but um, I've heard a couple of times um, – a couple of months ago, I, I was watching a series of videos, and like in a couple of videos in the span of a couple of days, I heard this, the same thing. I'm thinking, well, maybe this is a sign that this may be some truth to this about how battle in heaven, the wars in heaven, there really was an actual war in heaven where um, Archangel Michael uh, and his forces and um, uh, Archangel, bad Archangel Lucifer, which I guess is the um, the duality opposite of what Archangel Michael stands for. Um, Lucifer was of the dark forces and uh, Michael's forces won and the fallen angels um, came down to earth after this 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 um, thing. And this is what uh, the spiritual but not religious folks seem to believe that believe in archangels and guardian angels and higher d densities and okay. dimensions where these entities exist and I'm thinking okay these um, Namali stones could they be um, depictions of what the, these entities were in that specific battle between Archangel Michael and his counterpart Lucifer, any comments? I, I don't know. You don't know. I, I don't <laughs> Neither do I. But I know we're going out there. But uh, have you heard anything else about that? that uh, about the battle in heaven between Michael and his counterpart Lucifer? I, I don't. I don't have any knowledge of it, and um, and I know there are there are many theories. Um, you know, I've, I know that the um, the Indians, the Hindus, have some interesting perspectives, and, and uh, I've certainly meditated with Hindus over the years. And and uh, I know your Scientology people, if I believe, the last time I, I talked to some of them, they've got some interesting concepts of ancient aliens hundreds of thousands of years ago and still today living underground. So again, I'm I'm open I, because I am I'm no one to decide what is and what isn't. Uh, you know, I'm very open to and and always interested in and I I don't degrade or uh, or disrespect anyone's religious or spiritual beliefs because I want to have a right to my own and therefore I have to give everyone a right to their own. The only way that works. Fair enough. The old cliche radio two forward phrase, fair enough. <laughs> Only thing I could say to that. But uh, here's another thing that I, well, very fair enough if you want to wake people up. Namali at Artifact, African Art Museum Artifacts for Sale. This is another page on your site with a video of about 16 minutes. I see some um, uh, black lady with uh, some sort of artifact in front of her. She's got her hands yeah, up. She's the curator of the museum. That's Doris Ligon. She's a wonderful woman who founded the museum many years ago. And these artifacts are for sale? For real? You, yeah, you sell the Namali? Yeah, we have a couple dozen of them right now available. We've actually placed a few. Um, it's interesting when you when you put them in the person's hands who's ended up buying them, something, something happens. 
There was one I sold to a shaman, Jeff the Shaman, neat guy, down in the village in Bradenton, Florida. And I was down there visiting my mother. And I took some stones over to him, and I, I had this I had this one. It looked just like a blob. I mean, it was just like a lava blob. It was really cool, very ancient looking. And I said, Jeff, would you like to check one of these out? He's got a beautiful place here. It's called the Village Mystic. And a little place in Bradenton, Florida, they've turned an uh, area into a village. It's just beautiful, cosmic area with a lot of healing and arts. And... I said, Jeff, would you like to check one of these out? He said, yeah, I'd like to hold on to this and try it out. Now, Jeff has crystal skulls and very powerful stones that he's collected over many years, very extremely, extremely valuable, tens if not hundreds of times as valuable as the as the Nomali, which are many thousands of dollars themselves. But he took the stone and he put it on his shrine there with his crystal skulls, and I got back to him a month or two later. I got sidetracked, and I got back to him, and I said, Jeff, what did you think of that stone? And he said, he said, Ben, he said, uh, the stone told me it wanted me to use it in my healings. And he said, I have used it in every one of my healings since then. And he said, at one time I looked down while I was doing a healing, and I saw two other beings helping me with the healing with their hands on the client. Now, you can believe it or not believe. That's not my choice. You can say he's a kook or you can say whatever, but uh, people get healed. So <laughs> at the end, that's what matters. So back to the the point of our, what we're doing, we decided that these stones are best to be used by individuals where they can change lives and be used for communications, psychic readings, if you will, healings, um, what they can be activated for by those who are activated by them. And so, anyways, Jeff acquired that stone, and shortly thereafter, one of his uh, highly developed individuals he works with also acquired the matching stone to that one. And uh, so those those are the, the the things that matter. My My friend Patricia who has used the stones, has had amazing, amazing experiences with them. Uh, her friend Jody was in the room with one and just had a, a white light experience. Then on the other end of the spectrum, I sold one a couple months ago to a professor. She is a an elderly woman, wonderful woman, who has spent decades with indigenous tribes around the world. And she travels the world lecturing on where science meets art and the influence of indigenous tribes upon where science meets art. She also is working on studying nanoparticles, I believe is the term, nanoparticles. She's working with a number of uh, universities in America with a team that's the foremost team, one of the foremost teams, I guess, in the area of nanoparticles. Particularly, she's uh, right now studying neutrinos, if you're familiar with those. These are these microparticles that are so small, they've only now really starting to realize that they exist and what they do. Um, and she is firmly convinced that, well, not only did the, she meditate with the stone and help to heal the uh, problem she had, but she then also is firmly convinced that this stone is part of her study of neutrinos and is to be used in that. Now, how that all plays out, again, it's a matter of how open your mind is. But in other words, we're not just talking about um, people who have no experience or credibility. We're talking about people who are uh, foremost in different areas who can use the stone and as with her, she put that in the center of all of her stones and is now meditating with it. And, and perhaps it is a, somehow a receiver of neutrinos. How would I know? You know, she's a professor. I barely graduated high school. So that's why I always, like I said, as much as I can, uh, Andrew, I try to uh, you know, let, let other people say things. Because, it, you know, I think it's better to let other people who are experts 
uh, speak to their area. So that's some of what we've been doing, and, and that's the exciting part is putting them into the hands. And if you think about how many times a healer can use, if Jeff the Shaman uses that stone for the next decades, how many people can that stone influence as compared to sitting on a shelf in a museum? And I've come to believe that that's why they've been acquired in, by us, because that's where they want to be. Well, good luck on getting them out to the people who most uh, could benefit from them. Uh, another uh, thing here that I'm seeing on the site, uh, another page, there's a page with some pictures of uh, what appear to be swords and knives. These are, uh, we haven't brought this up yet, but these actual weapons or decorations from the same tribes people that utilize Namali, and what connection do they have to the uh, Namali and the tribes people that created the Namali stones? Yeah, well, the people initially brought out a variety of different items. Uh, I, I happen to prefer the Nomali. The weapons were interesting, but they're not something that I, uh, I uh, vibrate with as much. I just don't. Uh, but I did acquire those three. One of them was used by a soldier by the name of Ben Varai, who was a great warrior against the oppressive forces of, of Britain back in the day. And so they are very much venerated. Another one is a, just an old dagger. So they're kind of interesting, but more if you look over to the other page, you'll see the, the statues or, or the wooden figurines and the wooden masks. Those are, are from the same tribes. And they don't have a connection to Nomoli uh, gods per se. They are very different in their origin and, and their message. But... They're just very interesting. Uh, some were used for war. Some were used at shrines. And one of the interesting pieces in there is the Kongli mask. Uh, well, you can pronounce it Kongli. It, it's actually pronounced Kongli, Kongli. But they'll say Kongli with a C, Kongli with a K, or Gongli with a G. You can look it up on all three words. Uh, that's an interesting mask. And then there's the the other ones that are interesting are the uh, Zoe mask. It's spelled Zoe, S-O-W-I-E. The Zoe masks are the full masks that cover the head, and they are used by the females in the oldest secret society in the world known to still be in existence. And um, they would take the young ladies and teach them in the ways of of being a woman in the ways of medicine, in the ways of using the uh, plants and other natural things to heal. And, uh, and then they would be initiated into the society when they wore that helmet and did, did a dance. So, yeah, very interesting pieces. But those pieces are known. It's int you know what? One of the things that's kind of curious... Andrew, is that wooden pieces from Africa, and I was just talking with Baku about this the other day, that wooden pieces from Africa have, have a, a notoriety, and they have been uh, popularized. You'll see them frequently used as decorations in, in everywhere from homes to offices to the businesses, you know, lawyers' offices, etc. cetera. Um, but, again, the stones have been uh, very under under uh, exposed. Well, I'd li like to talk about these masks for a moment, and then we'll get back to the yeah, stones. Sure. We still have about uh, 40 minutes left. You want to end at 7.30, yeah. that's fine with me. Um, some of these masks, you look at them and say, <laughs> that's uh, what you'd expect uh a witch doctor to wear, although witch doctor is kind of um, a politically incorrect term, I, I should say. Shaman is much more appropriate. And, uh, a shaman or a medicine man is not uncommon to use. Yes. Um, and, uh, well, some of these have warrior written all over them. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the witch doctor ones with, uh, with like, the big eyes and the, um, like, the marks on the cheek and all... I mean, does, does how exactly does uh, the mask itself 
help uh, the shaman or the medicine men if it does, if they feel the need to to wear something, or is it just for show, like a bullfighter's uh, red cape is for show? I mean, um, well, you're, you're looking at some. There's a couple of them you're probably looking at which would actually. Uh, I, I mean, people would think they'd look voodooish. I think is what the word you're looking for, which is an interesting subject. The you know the fact that the whole voodoo concept has has really uh, frightened people in regards to things from West Africa is is interesting. I've spoken to a museum and someone said to me, "Aren't you afraid that these were all created for dark purposes?" And it's interesting how quickly people think about that with African art and African masks. They don't think about that with Native Americans so much, do they? It's interesting, South American, all of a sudden African, which from a common sense perspective, Andrew, I want you and your listeners to kind of walk along this with me for a second and see if it makes sense. You're in a country where you're in one of the poorest places in the world. Your infant mortality is extreme. Your poverty, your starvation, your dying of foul water, Every day, it's a struggle to live. I believe that it's obvious that your spiritual leaders would spend all of their time trying to improve that blight, that is the blight and the plight that your society is under. They would be there to help. The thought that these people who are starving, dying, barely existing, have time and sit around and decide that they're going to strike out and create evil to hurt other people is, is, is silly. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I believe that they are trying to survive and they're doing the best they can. And those spiritual leaders who have always been revered and honored are revered and honored because they help. They help to uh, solve, uh, to alleviate some of the suffering of the of the of where they live over there. Now, as far as a couple of those masks are interesting, they there are some of them that look straight up uh, frightening. And uh, if you were dancing around a fire at night and you saw one of them, you would likely be very scared if you were around the African fire. It would not be soothing by any means, the flash of the fire upon that face. Now, I have noticed a couple of things, and I'm not an expert in this area, so I want to put that right out there. But I've noticed a couple of things. Sometimes the uh, images that are most frightening will have features which might be more British than African. So there may have been some point in time the perspective that these were the evil ones, and they put their image on. Now, other ones are African images that are frightening also. It's my understanding that this is similar to, in the Middle Ages, I believe it would have been, in Europe, they have these door knockers. Have you ever seen the door knockers from then that are ghoulish-looking and frightening, and they're large? I think I have, yes. Yeah, if you're familiar, if you were to research that, you would find out that they were put on the front door. They were demonic-looking, frightened, scared, because that was intended to frighten off the very spirits that were trying to get in by using a, a mirrored image or a similar image. Um, so I believe that is perhaps part of the the usage of those masks in rituals to ward off the demons. And I say that because the only thing I have to relate to it is there is one Pumdo uh, devil nomali stone, very frightening, very well intricately carved. It's only one of them. I've seen other images of it, so I know there are others that have existed. Now, when I say the nomali, they're very rare. There are, of course, many uh, replicas that have been made over the years for tourists, etc., you know, that are out there with some of the similar images. So you can see the standard images. Now, I should talk more about the ones that are not the standard images, the elongated head ones before, we, before we're done. But the what I was talking about with this Pomdo uh, devil is that he is very frightening looking. 
and the the purpose of this this particular Nomali stone is for the village to use in rituals to ward off evil uh, demons. And uh, so, uh, you know, the psychology behind that is not, again, I'm not qualified to explain why you would use something that looks frightening to ward off frightening things, but that's what's been done historically. Thank you. And another feature about some of these uh Masks and headpieces, uh, they seem to have what could be construed as an elongated skull. Um, very uh, interesting, as a lot of people that are into ancient alien phenomenon mention the elongated skull and how uh, the idea that cradle boarding is the cause of it is flat out stupid. And uh, it definitely seems to have had an ancient alien connection, uh, like, like the Egyptian pharaohs, uh, like Akhenaten, they had a... Uh, elongated skulls and those headpieces were possibly warned to to conceal that fact from the the public that your yeah, leaders are really aliens and uh well is there a possible connection here between the like conehead uh elongated skull and these masks and the uh like the uh, nephilim and the giants and the um anunnaki coneheads and and all the rest of the other uh elongated skulls that the ancient astronaut theorists obsess about well, out of all of the Nomali I have seen over the years, we have a few pieces, and they were in the one display case you saw at the show, and they are very clearly examples of elongated heads. They certainly look similar to those from other historical finds, and again in South America and uh, in Egypt. So, yes, now, again, out of all of the stones, not not all of them have those elongated heads, but there are a few that are very clear. One of them even looks like it might have a helmet on. But there is a series that has, uh, that I've been able to, to collect. Um, and, yes, they, it's very interesting how they are. The One of the gentlemen I'm working with is Alex Cianetti. We sent you the picture of Alex. Alex is a neat guy. He's was with uh, he was a segment producer in the early years of Ancient Aliens TV. He's been around for 40 years or more. Um, he's done a lot of. He's he's the Indiana Jones guy. He's out there in the bush getting the getting the making the contacts and doing the research. And um, uh, what did I say about Alex? Just drew a blank. Oh, as long as you're trying to thought, it's okay. I have the same problem as a radio host. <laughs> Thinking about so many things to discuss, I ended up losing my train of thought too. But anyhow, um, I guess one last question about this: these masks here. The uh, yeah, you said some of them look kind of devilish. Oh, oh no, no. Let me let me finish. Alex Cunetti. Okay. That's right. Alex Cunetti yeah. was saying to me, I was talking to him last week. He's been involved with uh, some different stone finds, and he's told me that he was looking for something. and He finally found it about a tribe in South America that had stones which he believes are similar to the Nomali stones, and he's considering working on his theory that connects West Africa to South America and utilizing the stones in that regard. So I, I, that's what I wanted to finish up on your last question. Yeah, thank you. And you know what? I don't think I need to ask you about the uh... – <laughs> The, what the, appears to be devil horns on the um, skulls seems to be taking it to a negative way, talking about uh, what could be uh, construed as a fear-based thing. Uh, people well, are no, just... that's, that's all right. You'll have uh, you'll have horns anytime you have horns on, and this isn't just true of Africa. I believe you'll find this in Greece and in and the and Europe and every, very many places. Anytime you're going to find horns on a an artistic piece rendition, rendi rendering that represents male fertility. So, interesting. I have one piece here, one uh, uh, Zoe mask that has the Virgin Mary on top of it, uh, in the top of the artwork, and then horns with it, demonstrating their understanding that she was uh, both male and female by getting pregnant without. Um, a man, and uh, it's the only bare-breasted image of the Madonna you'll probably ever see also. 
But interestingly, that again, yes, whenever you're going to see the horns, that would be a depictation of of uh, of male fertility. The bigger the horns on a bull, or, et cetera, the you know the more fertile it would be considered. That's a very interesting fact. I never was aware of that myself, and uh, well, thank you for actually deciding to get into the horns thing because male fertility. I first time I've heard that, and that I did. Uh, Notice that thing of the the Madonna between the horns on that helmet. I never would have guessed that that was uh, an image of the Madonna. Um, just well, yeah, that, that, and that's uh, obviously a missionary got deep into the bush and somehow influenced the Zoe priestess, high priestess, the high priestess of the Zoe uh, secret woman society is actually called a Zoe, and convinced her that that was a power. And so each of the masks would have in it the representation of the power that they feel that initiate has in them. And so she that was a huge, powerful image of, that they would have of this woman who was able to have a child with gods and had a god as a child, especially uh, it's not unlike the concept that Zanomali lived with humans and infused their powers into them. Was that done through crossbreeding? We don't know. But... Uh, if you know, I mean, in their in their perspective, as far as what do they believe, I don't know what they believed as far as how that was done. But the theory was again that they, and, and I think you'll find this with the mass too, that these gods were giving them tools to get to, were giving them the things they needed. As example, if you watch the videos you discuss when Professor Foyanza discusses the the large chief piece that he's in front of initially. And he'll tell about how during the enskinment or the installment of a new chief, they would use that piece. They would set that up on an altar that actually has a bottom caved out, so it would affix to a protrusion on a shrine. The members of that tribe, which could be tens of thousands, would go in a procession and go and touch that stone. That's why it started off soapstone, but it has a reddish and different colors from the oils of the hands and they would touch that stone for days or weeks up until the upcoming time when that chief was indoctrinated. When he was indoctrinated, they would put the magic uh, liquid solution in the top in the little little hole that was in the top. It's only about an inch deep and uh, three-quarters of an inch round, and that would activate the, the spirit within the entire tribe, and they would then indoctrinate the chief, and it has the the things you would want a chief to have. It would, you know, it would be wise, it would be strong, it would be brave, it would, be, um, uh, it would have a strong heart for the people. And so these are the things which that stone not only represents, but how it was used in the, in the process, in the ceremonial process of, of a new chiefdom. Well, thanks. Um... Interesting there. Uh, another thing I want to talk about regarding the masks, uh, not the last thing, maybe uh, something else may come up again looking at them. They, they have so many questions to yes, just yeah. staring at us in the face. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Um, oh, they're cool. I have them sitting around here. I'm looking at them too. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully the good spirits of those masks are guiding you uh, on this show. <laughs> just I always ask my angels and guys to guide on the show. I hope tonight's no exception. I'm sure nice. No exception, but anyhow, uh, I digress. Uh, getting back to the mass and the voodoo thing you mentioned. Uh, now, this is an interesting phenomenon because voodoo seems to contradict something that many um, spiritual folks would assert, and that is that one needs to give their consent, their permission, in order for spiritual work to be done on them of any sort. And yet um, people assert that curses and hexes, that they do actually exist. And uh, voodoo, you, the whole... Um, thing you see with cartoon characters involving the doll being toyed with and the person represented by the doll getting tortured. Um, that's not really how it really works, or could it be like that if the voodoo witch doctor was good enough? I mean, what is the science of voodoo? How is it really, would the natives who practice it describe it? And if they saw like the stereotypical cartoon character thing of voodoo, would they be like, oh my god, you've totally uh, twisted and distorted uh, something that I perceive as good into some ridiculous <laughs> thing like this. This is not what voodoo's about. So, <laughs> what is it about? Can you tell us? 
Yeah, I, I am not an expert on voodoo either. My knowledge, my my understanding of it is, is that in West Africa there's little evil, if any evil, associated with voodoo. Again, it is a, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the gentlemen spoke about it um, at the conference we were at, and that completely misunderstood. That uh, would probably be my, uh, I would probably guess it's completely misunderstood. I would say this about the idea of spelling, casting spells on others. Um, you know, I'm just a firm believer that the power of light always wins, so uh, I'm not too concerned about people casting spells. As long as you've got enough light around you, spells aren't going to do much. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. There are, in many religions, there are demons. There are evil spirits in others, and uh, in, certainly in even more popular religions, such as I was raised Roman Catholic, there is a a belief in, in potential demonology. Exorcism is, is something many people uh, do not discredit. I would say this is one answer I would have. I remember the movie Serpent in the Rainbow, I believe was the name of it. And it documented the true story of the guys from maybe Boston, etc. the adventurers who went down to try to find out what it was with the zombies. You familiar with this, the zombies? In Haiti? The, 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 no, I'm not familiar with this. Well, zombies, there was a story, that the, it was documented. These people had died and in Haiti, and they, they died, and I believe it was Haiti, and then they came back, and they would be seen wandering around the graveyards, and they would seem to be completely uh, half dead, and that's where the, the theory and the whole concept of zombies came and the zombies, of course, was a spell that was put upon you by a voodoo witch doctor. So these researchers go down. These are, well, the, the pharmaceutical companies pay for these adventure researchers to go down, and they dig around, and they finally find out that it is true, that they have somehow developed a manner in which they can make a human being appear to be dead and that they bury this human being, and then at some point in time, a day or so later, they are able to dig this human being up, and they all come back to life, and they wander around, but they are mentally deficient and always seem to stay around where they were buried and seem to only have a recollection of that. So having decided that it's true, they're like, well, okay, well, let's find out what the deal is. Well, they find out when they cast this, spell upon the person, they shoot with their breath a white powder into their face. They come up right up to them and go, I curse you, and they go, woof, and they blow this white powder in their, their face. So they somehow finagle, very dangerous because it's a powerful group down there, and they're, they don't want their secrets revealed. They finally finagle and get, a, get some of the solution, and they dig back, and they find out, here it is, from a fish. It's some poison they get from a blowfish or something. I don't remember for sure. And they bring it back to America and they develop a new drug that helps people go through surgeries. So, was that witch doctor casting a spell upon the person without their will? Well, yeah, the same as if you dummy somebody with drugs, you're going to cast a spell on them. Um, now, does that discount? Am I discounting and challenging all voodoo doctors to cast a spell on me? No, I'm just saying that's what I know of it. Interesting take. Um, something I may want to bring up a few more times when I get the chance on my show, because, uh, like I said, it uh, seems to violate the, um, like, well, can you interfere with free will without getting permission? And if you don't have to get give someone permission, how do you prevent something like that from happening if you're a, a victim? Definitely a lot of questions to throw out there. We, but, met uh, with, um, we met with a man who received a healing. It was a man who felt like he received a healing at that show. Him and uh, two... His two healers were with him, and they asked if they could hold the stone, and we let him hold the stone. And there was something going on. It was very powerful energy. It's really amazing, especially in the middle of all that, you know, confusion, if you will, and uh, noise. And after that, we went up and we visited them last week, and one of the psychics, healers, said to me, she said, aren't you concerned these stones are very powerful aren't you concerned that people are going to take them and use them for evil purposes 
you know, aren't you responsible for that? And I said, well, first of all, I, I don't know that that would be a good idea because if the stone isn't designed for evil, it may just come back on you would be the first thing I would always be concerned about, projecting evil. But I also pointed out, I said, well, you know, when the uh, when the Inquisition murdered tens of thousands of people in the name of Jesus, was it Jesus' fault? <laughs> <laughs> and were they really using the power of Jesus? I don't think they were. I don't think they had the power of Jesus anywhere in that when they were killing all those people. That's not what he taught and not what his message was. So, you know, can you, does that mean you withhold something that has value because you're afraid someone's going to misuse it? No, I, I don't think so. And so far, I haven't found anybody who was interested in spending thousands of dollars on a stone so they could go after someone else and harm them, most of the people I meet in life are just trying to get through their own conditions and challenges, even here in America, just as, and that's why I figure the theory is the same in West Africa as it is here, because I know people who I go about my day every day, I don't know how you are, Andrew, but I run into people that are suffering grave physical, emotional, mental problems and strife and are looking for relief from those things. And they don't have time to go around looking to hurt other people. I mean, I, I just, if they're out there, I don't know. Who, I'm not running into them on a daily basis. Most people hurt other people as a byproduct of trying to promote them, their own issue. They don't go about trying to do it. But that's my own opinion. And that's, in my opinion, only there. Well, it's whatever the law of attraction allows you to experience, and the fact that you're not experiencing that shows that, well, law of attraction seems to want to reward you and guide you on the right path, so uh, that's a good thing. But um, moving on to some of these other uh, things here, got a little over 15 minutes left. Um, th well, first of all, um, the wooden figurines, um, are, are, the, how, are they wooden Nemani stones, or are they a completely different set of something? Yeah, the wooden figurines are completely separate. There's a couple of them that are interesting. If you'll see the the one that's kind of like a male and a female, the male, except he looks like he's got big breasts on his uh, thighs, and uh, he goes with a female, which has some interesting features. They, they Some of them just don't look uh, as African as, as you would expect. And they're used like the one with the red shirt. That is a... That is a a male warrior, and they use that before they go into battle. Very serious piece. That piece would be used only when the women were already in the tents because they are not to be near that that power, that force. And uh, so there's one, there's that one. The other wooden one that I find most interesting goes with a with a stone. The stone was separated with it for a short period, and then it was determined that they would not work separately. And that is a Zoe stone and stick. And the stone was dug up, I believe that was in the 1930s, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. And then thereafter, the high priestess of the Zoe tribe decided to carve a wooden stick to use with the stones, the three-legged stick with a little figurine on top. Uh, it's at the beginning of the museum piece video, and that's a pretty powerful piece, pretty powerful piece. That was used for healing um, purposes. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, the uh, specific material we're talking about here, what kind of uh, rock or stone are the stones carved out of? And if it's different one, uh, diff a set of different types of rocks and stones, please name them. And I, the wooden figurines, too, is that a special type of uh, wood, or is the type of wood varied? The stones are mostly soapstone. Some are granite, and some are out of a sedimentary stone, an uh, iron stone. Some, now, the, the gentleman, Jeff the shaman, believes that that one he has was a meteor, was what his was his impression. It certainly looked like it was made out of lava or meteor stone. It was very interesting. The wooden masks and wooden figurines, most of them are, are made out of not are not very hardened woods, and, and that's why they're you know they don't last for thousands of years. The Zoe masks are the interesting ones because they're all made out of a hollow tree trunk, 
hollowed out tree trunk or one piece, and they would put their, they're smaller than we are over there, just generally stature, and they would put their whole head inside of that helmet, uh, which is carved out of a, again, a tree trunk. And it would be a local artisan who was responsible for carving all of the Zoe uh, masks and who would be instructed by the Zoe High Priestess as far as what designs would be used in them. You know, there would be a certain representation of uh, am animals, perhaps, as you see one has a snake on it. The other one we talked about with the Madonna is a very, well, it's the only one I've ever seen with the Madonna. There's two of them I have. One's at the museum still. And uh, But there would also be images of different leaf patterns that would be the flower that that, that particular initiate would uh, connect with. All right. Uh, now, when we are looking at these uh, stones and uh, figures, this is, uh, well, the little debate here. The ancients depicted what they saw is what George Norrie and others assert. So one would say, okay, this is, they're depicting what they, uh, what they witnessed. But is that always the case? Uh, do the ancients uh, prefer to depict what they saw with their, when they're awake or prefer to uh, depict what they saw in dreams? Or uh, is it possible that if you believe that religions of the world were designed for brainwashing, is it possible that some malevolent force, like, I don't know, uh, malevolent reptilians perhaps, because you mentioned them earlier, um, may have brainwashed people into believing that the figures that they're carving are their gods, <laughs> and uh, that in that case they're, they're believing a lie, and they've just been suckered into following a religion that's totally fake. <laughs> and I'm not going to get into how the, all the other religions are like that to some degree, because it's not important. But the, the point is, um, what are they depicting with these depictions? Uh, something they saw when awake, asleep, or something they've been brainwashed to believe is real? Well, I, I did not say malignant uh, reptilians. Um, in fact, they believe that they venerate the crocodile in northern Africa. It's an animal that has power in the water and on land, which is the only animal that has that much power. And uh, so they, they venerate it, and, and they want to instill some of the values and the, uh, the, the things that a crocodile has that they see as usable in their own behaviors, you know, whether it's how to hunt or whatever it would be, how to survive. They feel that that's a venerated uh, animal, is what Kwaku would, would say. As far as the Nomali stones, the original Nomali stones, the natives believe, were given to them by the Nomali gods. No... No, no uh, African native that I am aware of would say, my great-grandfather was a great carver of Nomali. They would never claim that they have carved them. Now, there are potentially examples, again, of replicas, and there are deep in the bush those who may still be creating them in the last hundreds of years for purposes inside their own tribal use. But the original Nomali, the ones that are most sought after were those that were believed by the tribes to have been created by the Nomali gods and given to the tribal leaders as uh, tools to help them in whatever regards they could help them, if that answers that question. So other than that, there are the, those who would say that humans did carve them would say that they carved them in the image of the Nomali gods whom they lived amongst when they first descended to Earth. Now, what the, I think a better question I've always considered is what happened to the Nomali gods? Did they integrate into the humans? Did they uh, did they die off? That would be unusual to think. But uh, there's no real ever ever heard anything from any source as far as where did they go after that. But I guess that's true of of the other cultures that people believe came and visited Earth over the years. I don't know if they believe they integrated or left or coming back and forth. I don't know the answer to that, what the beliefs are. Well, um, are we perhaps, uh, since we're talking about shamans and witch doctors, perhaps um, any uh, 
schematic use of entheogenic substances by these tribes people, like uh, Iboga seems to be the uh, schematic uh, drug of choice for uh, those who choose to go on uh, psychedelic trips. Uh, South America, it's ayahuasca. In North America, maybe it's uh, the peyote cactus in the, in the Southwest, if you live. Uh, in Africa, it's Iboga. So, uh, is this, but does Iboga grow in a different part of Africa than the part that we're talking about here, the Sierra Leone region? And if it does, what other substances could, could not saying they did, but could have used to um, help enhance their creativity and perhaps uh, depict these things? <laughs> Yeah, and I believe that there are so many, and that's what science and medicine are now finding, aren't they, that there are so many. And they're looking back and finding that these people really did have uh, uh, solutions to medical problems, and they dis we've discounted them, and, and we're looking back and we're saying yes. Now, as far as I know in America back in the 70s, it was um, the mushrooms was the the manner of getting there, and there are those who believe that mushrooms – we're floating through space and uh, could be timeless. So uh, I, I don't know, but I think it's interesting, isn't it, Andrew, that everywhere in the world they seem to find that. I mean, didn't you ever wonder how did the first guy figure out to get that ayahuasca and then mix it with the other stuff and do this and do that? I mean, did you ever see how they mix it? It's not like you just eat the mushroom. Somebody had, I mean, how did they know to do that? And so that's the funny, the interesting thing is around the world, People, shamans, have found whatever substance, and I'm a believer that in every part of the world there's something, that God puts something in every part of the world to uh, open up the consciousness. And uh, man, those who are seeking enlightenment, seem to somehow find out and get a message on how to eat the right one, or if they eat the wrong message, I guess, then they die from the wrong mushroom. <laughs> but you know what I mean by the ayahuasca? I, I can't pronounce that all of a sudden for some reason, but um, it's it's quite a complex process to bring it out of the root, and it's not something you would think. It's not a root. I think it's a vine, it's, uh, but it doesn't. You, know, you wouldn't just wander across and say, "Boy, that looks appetizing." You know, somebody had a vision even to know to to, to do that. But whether it's the berserkers or whether it's the shamans from around the world. There are always those who lead the, uh, who are there for the, the village when they run into problems that are not, cannot be dealt with in a normal pattern. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for that. And, uh, well, I, I'm actually going to be doing ayahuasca over the, uh, in the week before Christmas when I go to South America for a Machu Picchu retreat. I'll, uh. Hopefully I'll get something out of it, and maybe I'll answer your question there. How did they uh, – well, I don't know if anybody who's uh, used that stuff has actually gotten the answer to that question while on the stuff about how they knew how to mix the stuff together in the proper ways with the vine and the DMT containing plant. It is a mystery of uh, – it's not something you – you try a thousand times until you fail, like Edison, or uh, right, right. Or why? Why would you try it? Why? <laughs> what makes you, you know? How would you know there was something? Exactly. Yeah, how would you know there was something there? Right. Right. Um, well, you know, it was mentioned too by I, there was a guy who came to the show before that we were at, and this guy was really cosmic, and he had done a number of trips to South America, and I asked you, and he. He's, I was really interested at one point in time. He, he said, you know, you do, you do it a number of times. He said, and then he leaned up to me real close, close and he said, and then one time it whispers in your ear. He said. <laughs> and a uh, really interesting cosmic character. I was really, uh, really uh, happy to meet him. You know, I think he was up there. And he told me something which maybe you'll want to think about. He said that we really should have someone who is on Ayahuasca utilize the stones and see what type of readings they get. He felt that would be very significant. Well, uh, I don't know what the gods would think of, uh, of that, but, uh, interesting, interesting, uh, thought of an experiment there, but, uh, Anyhow, we got five minutes left, so I um, want to give this chance for you to get at anything you like, any conferences you may be going. Make one more sales pitch if there's anything you feel that's worth getting out about trying to, to, to get this stuff sold to the proper people that could use them and their healing powers and whatnot. 
So, um, I mean, uh, are you, am I going to see any more conferences like maybe Alien Con in Los Angeles and on the uh, summer solstice? I'll be there for that. I, I don't know. You know, I offered to speak at Alien Con and they were, they, they did not uh, take us up on it and do a presentation. So I don't know. I don't have any plans at this point in time of being in shows. But I would encourage any of your listeners to look at the video at ancientalienstones.com. Go to about 420. Look at the stones and see if there's anything that uh, that you pick up on them. Uh, and I put this out before. I'm almost, I almost think it's futile. But if anyone out there has had any experience with these stones, because that's what's amazing to me. We are writing the book. Buck, who's writing the book, and, and I'm going to be helping with that. We're also looking at putting together a documentary. We're going to be putting together a panel of, of psychics and um, and have them review the stones on camera. And so there's a lot of exciting work to be done, and I encourage anyone who has any interest to even just get the word out about them. And, and uh, experimentation, we're certainly interested in experimentation. Um, so it's, a, it's exciting. It's an exciting opportunity. There are so few things like this, so powerful, so mysterious, so enigmatic, but so unknown. And I'll end by saying this. I have tried, like I said, for a couple of years to get the guys at Ancient Aliens to do the show. I've gone to some other the big players. There doesn't seem to be an interest. Now, Alex and others would tell me it's because of a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the stones, has to do more with the way those organizations run and what they're trying to do. But I think that just means that it's up to to us, you know, to get the word out and to uh you know, to have some fun and get the stones out there. I I believe that it's possible that there is a power there are many powers throughout the world that are not being fully utilized and those powers want to be utilized. And um and so I'm, I'm excited to be part of the awareness and exposure, and it's always really enlightening to see a stone get into the hands of someone whose life somehow gets better, whether other people believe it or not is irrelevant at that point. And I thank you very much for inviting me on your show. And I thank you very much for... Uh... Being a guest, uh, my show said a little bit of a unfortunate bad luck turn with, uh, among other things, Wednesday guests postponing and not being able to do Friday shows because I've been going to conferences week in and week out, three conferences in a in as many weeks the past three weeks, and um, unfortunately I can't even monetize my channel anymore, Nature of Reality Radio, the YouTube channel where I upload all my shows because the face the YouTube I'm used to saying Facebook Nazis but YouTube Nazis. Uh, said I copyright violated, um, so they're not letting me monetize. That's bull crap. Uh, all I do is interview people, and they speak out answers. There's no copyright violation there, and uh, I haven't oh. shown it. And now, well, to top it all off, one of the previous guests I had, um, Vasilios, uh, that guy with the Greek name, uh, who disappeared off the face of the earth. He allegedly followed a, filed a copyright strike against me. Did he really <laughs> send him a message telling him, what is your problem, dude? I let you come on my show and you file a copyright strike and that when you and all your materials has disappeared off the earth for eight months. It makes no sense. Well, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't respond, but maybe he is thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. I can assure you there are people faking me, <laughs> which isn't so unusual the way uh, these things go down. But <laughs> yeah, people have been trying to, to be censored of Bill Burns. Uh, yeah, I had him as a guest on my show. He said UFO hunters no doubt canceled for exposing too much information. It's a good thing Ancient Aliens hasn't suffered the same uh, fate yet, but uh, they're they're coming after us. So it's good to have a, a guest on. And glad you could come on, because it seems like uh, getting, getting harder and harder to get these shows out for some reason. <laughs> but this mm -hmm. was great, very interesting interview. Maybe look at West African art and stones and figurines in a whole new way. So thank you very much. Yes, and when you're down there with your shamans in South America, see if they have any. Uh any interest or any information they can tell us. Thank you very when much. Your, I will do that. Pick anything up, just bring it back. If not, that's understood. You're going to be visiting many places already. <laughs> right. You'll have a great trip, I'm sure. Yeah, I will. All right, and good luck. Take care now. Many blessings.